Boulder is a city that has a reputation for being environmentally conscientious, but like all communities, it produces waste that has to be discharged back into the environment. Wastewater from businesses and homes come here to the city's wastewater treatment facility. This facility is actually the third facility for the city of Boulder. As a city, we've been treating wastewater for well over 50 years, closer to 70 or 80 years. There are continual challenges with capacity due to population, as well as effluent limitations due to regulatory drivers. And those two things are, are primarily what causes this facility and our staff to continually up the game and perform at a higher level of treatment. In 2007, the plant was substantially upgraded and now discharges water that's generally much cleaner than required by state and federal standards. Prior to the upgrade, the process was less effective and water quality much poorer. Wastewater treatment is regulated using a broad array of measurements. So a lot of parameters do have monthly limits imposed and that's kind of a, a traditional way to regulate pollution. Uh, EPA and state have, depending on what constituent it is, whether it's an organic or a metal or a nutrient, have imposed different uh, averaging periods into the effluent limitations. So it could be actually an annual average. It also could be a weekly, a seven-day average, or it could be a, what we call a daily max, or it could be what we call a grab sample, literally just a cup full at an instantaneous moment where is that in violation or not. So in order to get our hands around that and properly manage and operate to be in compliance, yeah, we are collecting some data continually, literally coming in every second or every few seconds um, for data. One of these measurements is the level of ammonia in the effluent. Ammonia is regulated because it can have harmful effects on aquatic life in the creek and is a good indicator of the plant's overall performance. In some processes of this kind, it's not feasible to take daily observations, so samples are taken on random occasions. The problem then is that we don't know whether these random observations that we have are representative of the whole. But in Boulder, the data is taken every day, and this enables us to explore the statistics of sampling. Let's look at data from before the upgrade to see how the random sampling can give us an accurate sense of the efficiency of the plant at that time. We can use a computer with a random number generator to give us a random sample. Now here we've got 36 daily observations of ammonia levels across a given year, randomly chosen. Now we can easily find the mean average of these observations, x bar, we simply sum them and divide by 36. And this gives us 188.1 divided by 36 equals 5.23. The standard deviation of the sample is 4.31. Now if you wish, you can check that this is the case. If you've forgotten how, you can refer back to film 5 or simply enter the data into an Excel spreadsheet. But how close is the average of the sample to the true average of the plant's daily ammonia emissions across the year? Can we be sure that our sample is a good approximation of that actual value? It's hardly likely to be spot on, but we know that the probability is 1 minus alpha that E the maximum error is Z sub alpha divided by 2 times sigma over the square root of n, where Z sub alpha over 2 is the value of the normal distribution, with alpha percent of the distribution being between plus and minus this value. Sigma is the standard deviation, where n is the sample size. Let's suppose we want to be 95% confident about our sample, i.e. 1 minus alpha equals 0.95. Then from the table of normal curve areas, Z sub alpha over 2 equals Z sub 0.025 equals 
1.96. Now we've got a small problem here. We want to know the standard deviation of the whole population, but it's often not possible to know this. So we have to use the standard deviation of the sample. Now this is generally thought to be acceptable, providing that the sample is at least 30. And we've got 36 observations. So substituting into our formula, we have 1.96 times 4.31 over 6 equals 1.41. We're 95% confident that the error in the sample is not more than 1.41. To make it clear, we can't be certain that the true mean will lie within this error, but we can be sure that it will do so 95% of the time, 19 times out of 20. Now, because in this case we do have information about all the daily emissions, we can check to see whether this is one of those 19 out of 20 occasions. If we look at the data for the whole year, we discovered that the mean average daily emission of ammonia was actually 5.46. So we can now check to see whether our sample mean was indeed accurate to within the error we calculated. Our sample average was 5.23. So the difference is 5.46 minus 5.23 equals 0.23. Clearly less than our calculated 1.41. So this time, it was within that margin of error, but it was always likely we had a 19 out of 20 chance of being within 1.41 because we used a 95% confidence level. In 2007, the facility underwent a redesign and upgrade using a system called Biological Nutrient Removal Activated Sludge. We bring the water and the solids in, we clean them up, we turn them into materials that are a lot bit more beneficial for the environment, and then we release them back into the environment. We don't have to store them or stockpile. It's just all a nice big circle, kind of a recycle circle, where what we create, we end up putting back in. The Headworks is where we remove the debris and trash that is in the, in the raw wastewater. We're now at the primary clarifiers. This is where we allow the organic material to settle, the heavy organics to settle. We call that raw sludge. And once settled, we pump that off for further treatments. We thicken and then digest that material. What we're interested in here is the liquid portion that remains in the middle. We pass that on as dissolved organics for further treatment. The heart of the plant is the activated sludge tanks where microorganisms do the critical work of digesting and degrading pollutants. So this is where we grow and manage a microorganism population to convert dissolved organics into more microorganisms which we can then settle by gravity and pump off. So we end up with a, with a clear effluent. So the microorganisms will consume ammonia and convert that to, to nitrate which is NO3 we let the organisms, a different set of organisms, convert that nitrate into nitrogen gas, which then releases to the atmosphere. So that's called denitrification, that step of nitrogen removal. Wastewater becomes clean water, biosolids for use on farms and gardens, methane gas to power generators, and nitrogen and carbon dioxide gas released to the atmosphere. These are actually processes that would occur out in nature over just a much broader time scale and, and a much larger environmental platform. So we're taking those processes and really just compressing them in time and space. The new plant is very effective at removing ammonia and other pollutants from the water. So much so that ammonia discharge into the creek is nearly zero, with daily averages between 0.1 and 0.5 milligrams as compared to an average of more than five for the old facility. While this level of discharge is the new norm, it's not the average 
because sometimes the system fails, and when it fails, the amount of ammonia discharged rises sharply. This is a microbiological process. Single cell, multicell organisms are absolutely at the core responsible for achieving the treatment. They often get to a point where they're not happy. The, the environment changes such that they are not thriving, reproducing, biodegrading components like they should. There's a couple times a year where we end up scratching our heads because we think we've done everything perfectly and we lose track of our treatment. And that, that happened probably about, I don't know, six, eight months ago. We had, we, we don't know what happened. All the bugs died. There was hardly any life and it could be from a toxic dump, an industry dumping on us. We, we don't know. Um, it took a while to recover from that, but we did recover. Managing wastewater treatment is enormously complex with many factors beyond the control of operators. So for us, it's, it's all about data and good data. We, we base almost every decision on, on data. That is what we are called to do, is meet effluent limitations and, and if possible, exceed them meaning exceed them in a good way, uh, having, having much lower levels than our effluent limits. The discharge from the new facility is a vast improvement on the old system. And this is a result of new activated sludge technologies. But it's also a consequence of careful data collection and sampling and statistical analysis that all contribute to a good management practice. With random sampling, we can never be sure that the sample is a good estimate of the true mean. But once we understand sampling procedures, we know the extent to which we can rely on our data. Good data, derived from accurate sampling, can improve decision-making in any industry. <laughs>